Okay, it is 9.46, we should make a start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's event to launch our new report, At the Frontier, the Geography of the UK's New Economy. As the title of the report suggests, the report looks at the geography of the new economy. It also looks at the factors that are affecting the geography, why the new economy is distributed across the UK in the way that it is. And it also sets out a bunch of policy recommendations for how we can better support the new economy now and in the future. Before we go any further, big thanks to HSBC UK for supporting this project. We've worked with them on uh, several projects and they are great partners to have on this project and on the previous as well. So the way we're going to do it uh, is in a moment, my colleague Paul Swinney, who's the Centre's uh, Director of Policy and Research, and also one of the co-authors of the report is going to take us through the main findings and the policy recommendations. And that'll take us about 10 minutes or so. And then we've got a fantastic panel to, uh, to respond and debate the findings and the implications. And the panel, uh, we have two currently on the call. One will join us very shortly. So our, our first panel is Fran Howell. Fran is the Managing Director and Head of Corporate Banking for the Midlands Region at HSBC UK. And our second panelist is Lee Purnell. Lee is the founder and chief executive of Petalite, which is a new economy business uh, based in Birmingham. And Lee will tell us a little bit more about his nature of his business when we get to that appropriate point. And our third panelist uh, is and will be Andy Street. And Andy, as you know, is the mayor of the West uh, Midlands. So those are our three panelists. They'll come in in a, in a wee while once we've heard from Paul. If you want to join the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag is uh, hashtag new economy. And obviously there's chances always to put your questions to the panel uh, and to put your comments in. You can do that at any time. Use the Q&A function. We'll get to them at the appropriate point. So without further ado, let's go to Paul. Let's get the, the, the main findings and the policy recommendations, and then we'll move on. Paul, over to you. Marvellous. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. Uh, let me, as Andrew says, take about 10 minutes to run you through the headlines of what the report looks at. So what we do is use a, a quite a new data set to try and look at what we call the new economy of the UK. So, so what is the new economy? Well, it's those industries that are very much at the, the, the cutting edge of the economy, you know, emerging, uh, likely the growth industries of the future. And we've got a number of different uh, sectors that fall into that. Artificial intelligence, software as a service, advanced manufacturing, uh, sensors, etc. You know these types of things that you might expect you know to be at the cutting edge. If you were to sit down and think, well, what sectors would they be? Now, the difficulty about trying to identify those in the past is that standard approaches to try and categorize these companies just don't capture them. So the standard codes that the ONS use and, and other European statistical agencies use you know, can't capture almost by definition you know these emerging elements of the economy. So what we've done is we've used data from a company called the Data City, which web scrapes data to try and identify these companies. And it uses words on their websites to be able to identify that one company is net zero, another company is software as a service, another one is gaming, another one, another one is software. And they create a fantastic data set, which has allowed us then to produce this report. So what does it then find? Well, let me uh, run you through uh, that. We love a map at Centre for Cities, and we don't have uh, love this one, this lovely spiky map, which looks at the where these new economy businesses are registered. And what you can see here is that it's not smoothly distributed across the country. It's really, really concentrated, and it's really, really spiky in certain places. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, you can see there's a ginormous spike there for London, but if you do look across the country, you can start to pick out um, other spikes there too, of which Birmingham is prominent, Manchester is prominent. You can see Cardiff sticking up there in, in Wales. In Scotland, you can see Edinburgh and Glasgow being uh, pretty clear as well. But what we'll do, what we do in the report is try and simplify this a little bit. And we put this the country into four categories. You've got city centres, so the real sort of very core of, uh, of our 63 largest cities and towns. Then you've got the suburbs, so city suburbs, so basically the rest of cities. So that would be Edgebaston in, in Birmingham's case, or would be Stockport in, in Manchester's case, in terms of how we define Manchester. So the, the rest of the city, the rest of that build-up area. Then we've got hinterlands, which are commutable areas um, 
uh, around cities. And then we've got deep rural, which are fairly isolated places. Think, you know, mid Wales or think Northumberland or northern Northumberland or, uh, or the Highlands, for example. And if we then look across these four categories, you can see really very strongly what this concentration of the new economy looks like, the, the cutting edge part of the economy looks like. So for cities as a whole, so city centres plus suburbs, you can see there the account for about 8.7% of land. But if you go across to the right hand column, you can see that they account for around about 59% of all of the, the new economy. So 9% of land, 59% of all of these types of businesses. If we then sort of look at the city centre in particular, we can see that there's an, a, 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 a particular concentration of these, uh, these companies within city centres. So they account for 0.1% of all land, but 13% of the new economy clusters into those very, very small parcels of uh, the UK. If we then look at, say, the other end to try and get a bit of, uh, uh, a bit of contrast there, if we look at the, the deep rural areas, we can see they account for over half of all land within the UK, but they account for just 9.2% of all of these cutting edge new economy businesses in particular, which is telling us that there's something about place, there's something about the inherent benefits of particular places that appeal to this cutting edge element of uh, of these types of sectors in particular. And this varies a little bit according to different types of, uh, of activity within what we define as the new economy. So here we've got all 48 sectors. I'm not going to run through all of them. But what's interesting is that if you look towards the left hand side, where we've got an especially great concentration within city centres, we tend to see the service element of new economy. So there we've got ad tech, we've got software as a surface, service, sorry, fintech, uh, gaming, streaming, for example. Whereas towards the other end, you tend to see more sort of non-service activities, manufacturing type activities that, uh, that don't sort of, uh, value a city centre location quite so much. But what is interesting is even these manufa more manufacturing type companies still are clustered within cities in particular, and the city is particularly attractive relative to, to deep rural areas, um, which is quite interesting. Now, the question is, well, why is that? Why do we see these patterns? Well, it's because of the inherent benefits that different places offer. So what do cities and city centres in particular offer? Well, they offer access. Access to lots of skilled workers and access to ability, have face to face interaction with other people, with other businesses, where you can share ideas and information. And these two things in particular are particularly important for knowledge based uh, businesses at the frontier of the economy, like these new economy businesses, because the creation of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge is, is particularly important for how their business models work. It's how they you know, then commercialize that knowledge and then push their companies on. And that's why we see this concentration of these types of companies in particular within uh, urban areas. However, we don't see this, uh, or we see quite a lot of variation across cities, which suggests that maybe some places are offering these benefits to a much greater extent than others. So top of the, the pile, if we look at the new economy, number of new economy firms relative to, to populations across the 63 largest towns and cities, uh, top of the pile are places like Milton Keynes and Cambridge, um, and that is indicative of the fact that this new economy very much clusters um, within uh, cities in the greater southeast in particular. And then bottom of the pile, which breaks my heart to say, is Sunderland. That is the city that has the fewest new economy businesses of, uh, of all the 63 places that we look at. Now, why is this important? Well, what we know, and lots of literature on this, is that um, so the emerging new economy and innovation in particular, what happens within these uh, companies, is what drives long-term productivity growth. You know, it's what drives long-term economic prosperity. And what you can see here from this chart is that, that this chart backs that up at the local level. So you can see that those places that have a large new economy, which is the, uh, the axis along the bottom, uh, are also more productive, which is the axis up the side. So more new economy businesses, more of these high productivity, innovative, innovative type companies, the higher productivity tends to be uh, across different places. So it's pretty important in terms of how attractive a place is, attracting in these new economy businesses, of growing these new economy businesses in terms of how well their economy performs. Now, what's interesting um, when we then look at uh, city size v uh, new economy performance is that we don't really see any relationship. Now, followers of Centre for Cities Work will know that uh, we have shown that it is big places in particular behind London that are really punching below their weight in the UK economy, and that's costing the UK economy many billions of pounds a year. Now, if we don't think that there is, as the literature suggests, this link between the new economy and innovation and economic performance, it therefore comes as no surprise that if there's no relationship between overall economic performance and city size in the UK, that we also won't see any particular perform, uh, link between the size of the new economy and the size of cities in the UK as well, uh, which is not what we see uh, in other developed countries. And this is exactly what this chart shows, not really much of a relationship. Now, there are two things I think going on here. 
One is that we do have some overperforming fairly small places like Milton Keynes, Reading and Cambridge, you can see towards the top left of that chart. But I think much more important from a UK economy perspective is that we do have a number of large cities that are underperforming, which also mean that we don't see a particularly positive relationship in this chart. So especially here in Manchester, Birmingham and Glasgow, you can see there towards the right hand side, but also you know, places like Liverpool and Newcastle perhaps should be forming uh, much better than what they, they actually do. And because they don't, that has an impact on their wider regional prosperity, but also the performance of the national economy too. Which is why when we then come to policy recommendations, of which there are many in the report, but let me just focus on or one or two because of, of time, that we have some very specific recommendations for Birmingham, Manchester and Glasgow in particular. So the first finding from this report is that um, policy should use lens, place as the lens to encourage new eco activity rather than being overly specific in terms of sectors. I think from a, from a policy perspective in the past, we've tended to go, well, actually, we're going to focus on industry X or industry Y or industry Z. What the report shows is actually all these types of industries tend to locate within particular places because of the benefits that that place offers are not as the case may be. So that suggests actually trying to get those wider benefits right within the, that place is much more important than trying to sort of take a punt at whether it's, you think it's going to be sector X, sector Y or sector Z that's going to grow in the future. In order to address the underperformance of big cities in particular, what we suggest is the government should create a £14.5 billion growth package, which we spend over 10 years to focus on just three places, and that is Manchester, Birmingham and Glasgow. Now, the government has done some of this preferencing already in the, the levelling up white paper earlier this year, where it identified these three places to be innovation accelerators, but it only gave them £100 million to, in order to do something with that. We're saying that if we're, going to, if we're going to deal with the challenges that these three places face, which really holds back the UK economy, we need to do something pretty big. It's not £100 million, it's £14.5 billion at least. Now, you're probably thinking that seems a little bit naive, a little bit unrealistic, given the tone of the autumn statements that, um, that we've just had. But the crucial thing about the majority of this money is that it's already been identified, it's already in the budgets, it just hasn't been allocated. And the biggest chunk of this is the uplift that the government wants to have in terms of R&D spending outside the Greater Southeast, which we think it's, it's saying it's going to spend about £7 billion a year extra outside the Greater Southeast. We're saying spend £1 billion of that each year within these three places in particular and focus it around their universities. So all of this has been already identified. And then finally, no, this is not just us saying focus on these three cities and do nothing if anywhere else. We should be doing stuff for other places. Again, we've got a number of recommendations around that. But the big one is that we need to set out a plan about how we're going to spend that remaining £6 billion a year in different places. Government hasn't quite really got that. But I think what this report shows is that the new economy and innovative companies located in very specific places, which need, also need to therefore be guiding this money into specific places if we do want to be increasing the amount of innovation, if we do want to be driving the new economy forward rather than having a blind approach or, or a very much a, a jam spreading approach across uh, giving something for uh, everywhere. So I will leave it there and hand back to Andrew. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul. Admirable job of uh, summarising quite a lot of work that's in the report. You can look at the report and everything else around it on our website, and I'll say that again towards uh, the end. But for now, um, don't forget to post your comments or questions in the Q and A uh, function. Let's hear from our panelists. And first off, I'm going to go to Fran. So, Fran, give us a view from the HSBC UK about the importance of these types of activities to you and to the to the economy as you understand it. Thanks, thanks, Andrew, and good morning to everyone. Um, uh, to, to my mind, the key question for today's discussion is how we unlock the potential that exists both at home and abroad to harness innovation to drive that economic growth. Uh, at the heart of the answer, I think, is partnership, whether that be between businesses, sectors, policymakers and communities. Uh, the economic opportunity presented by highly productive clusters of innovation outside of the global golden triangle for both regional growth and national economic recovery, I think, is enormous is absolutely enormous. Um, HSBC is here to lean in and support businesses to innovate, whether that be through our international network or through our latest SME lending fund of 15 billion, which includes 500 million ring fenced pot to help SMEs thrive in a low carbon economy, or a 250 million growth lending pot we just launched for high growth tech businesses to support scale ups early in their growth journey. 
But I think access to finance is only one part of the jigsaw, which is why we have other panelists here today. Alongside that, we need proportionate and predictable regulation, trade openness, investment in skills, R&D, innovation, digital connect connectivity and policy predictability. Um, Beyond, I think beyond the headline figure, Andrew, we talked about today, the 14.5 billion growth package, the challenges ensuring the government and other public sector bodies lean in and tap into unlocked capital to drive up productivity. Uh, and I think this means having a pipeline of bankable and investable uh, projects that we can jointly work on that and facilitate that. Um, so whilst I think many of these issues are not new, the scale of the challenges is great. Uh, is in my memory, but I think we can get this right, working together to create the conditions uh, that in turn can help mobilize private finance uh, at scale. And uh, we've seen that in the West Midlands. Uh, look at the work that Andy Street's been doing here, attracting investment into sustainable and innovative technologies that will help support jobs and growth in local area as well. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, uh, Fran. And picking up many of the themes in the report around you know, yes, you focus on the specifics, but actually thinking about uh, creating the general conditions that allow uh, different types of firms to, to thrive. Let, let's hear from one of those uh, firms that is based in uh, Birmingham. Lee, just give us a little bit about, you know, Petalite, but also about, you know, why Birmingham is, is an attractive location for you to, to have your business based in. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, so uh, I run a company called Petalite. We develop charging technology for the new wave of electric vehicles coming onto the market over the next few years. Um, this includes land and air and sea. So you'll soon see electric aircraft flying through the sky, annoying you every single day. Um, one of the, the most important things about um, why we, we moved to Birmingham and we started in Birmingham um, was because, to be honest, it was much cheaper to operate than London. Um, I have to have a large office. I have to have lots of staff. Um, it's not the ability to work out of a, a WeWork, for example. Um, and so, yes, it's very, it's very driven by the economics of you only get so much money from investors. How do you use that in, in a wise and appropriate way? Um, also, I... I had my education at Aston University, so there was some legacy network connections that I had here. Um, there was also some of the accelerators that started me off, so gave me free office space. Um, the shout out to the BC program that happened at uh, Aston University. Um, and so, yes, there was always that encouragement to why don't you come down to London all the time? But when you could get a £20 train ticket down to London in the middle of the day, why why would you need to do that if you could just spend most of your time up here and then also um, go down to London to find things like investment? Um, what I look to see out of, of, of this report, and I, I just want to summarise it, is that um, I like the idea of, of the the serious commitments um, that are being proposed. Uh, obviously that had to go to central government, um, but we need to make big strides in this field. If you look at the 14 and a half billion, that's spread over quite a few different um, sectors and markets. Um, but when you compare that to what's happened after, after the COVID pandemic in the US, the numbers are, are multitudes more. And obviously their economy is bigger, but it's nowhere near in comparison. Um, and what we're in, in the automotive industry, so a lot of uh, EV startups in the UK are actually going on the New York Stock Exchange. They're going to they're setting up production in the US, and it's because it's doing what the Chips and the Inflation Reduction Act were intending to do, and that's attract new business. And so, for us, when when you talk about say 100 million, it's it's nothing. Unfortunately, it's nothing in in a market that's worth trillions of pounds over the next few decades. Um, so, yeah, I want to see a, a bit more of a bold approach from from central government. Um, I want to see that we can we can get this going now, because if it's four years from now, you've already lost the game on a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, and so they need to move quickly and they need to be quite bold. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lee. And in his comments, Lee mentioned the CHIPS uh, and Science Act in the US, which we looked at as part of this particular piece of work. So you can get some detail on that in the report. And also, uh, I did a podcast recently with a, a colleague from the Brookings Institute looking at uh, the certain aspects, the place-based aspects of the CHIPS Act and what we could learn from that in a UK context. You can find that on the website as well. So shameless plug for that. Uh, okay, 
So let's move on and get the thoughts of, of the mayor of West Midlands. Andy, good to see you as always. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Good to see you, Andrew. And I just say, you know, I think you expect me a bit later. I was on right from the beginning. So you were, I, I, as I was saying, he's about to arrive. You arrived or you were already there, as always. You're yeah. you're always slightly ahead of me. So, you know, that nothing changes there. But it's good to see you. All right. Uh, so you need to respond to what's been said. Yes, so, please. And first of all, lovely to hear what Francis and Lee had to say. So, uh, no bull, this is a very important report. And I really appreciate the work that you put into it. And Paul summarised it brilliantly, because I think it's actually really, really significant. Um, and it goes to the heart, really, of what we've been trying to do for a number of years. And we know we've got to do even more as the economy has been battered uh, by COVID. So, because the principle of this is really very, very simple. We will only get a more balanced total UK economy, which is what's at stake here. Therefore, we can have national policy that works for everybody if we get all of our... The obvious point, I know you understand, is the major city drives the performance of the total regional economy. And actually, that was called out in the government's lovely white paper. And the only way we're going to achieve that improved performance is a real concentration in the new economy areas. That's not a new insight. All the data is, though. So I don't first of all, I, I don't want us to appear helpless here that we're waiting for the government to do something. We have tried to do some things ourselves. And Francis very kindly called them out. And I won't go through too many, but if we just think what we're trying to do in the skills area, where we're really trying to put our resources with our universities, with our colleges, into making sure people are qualified for these new areas. So a real deliberate tilt to the skills required here. And what we hear in all of the big inward investment decisions is people come here in these sectors because of the talent. So I think that is mission critical and a good concentration of the right universities. And Lee kindly called out that contribution to him is really important. The second piece that Francis called out, which is what is your what is your offer for inward investment? You've got to choose. You've got to choose. You've got to specialise. And again, if I think when we've just been around the world to India or we've been uh, over to Toronto and Boston this year, we are concentrating in all of our material on some of these areas. So whether it be obviously for us, advanced manufacturing and the e vehicle sector that Lee called out, whether it be fintech that Francis called out, absolute focus on that inward investment piece. And there is obviously a link there to uh, the trailblazer devolution deal because we do not yet have the full powers we would need for what you might call a regional investment strategy. And then also, if you think of what we've tried to do around connectivity, the 5G connectivity, absolutely critical, some of these sectors. So what comes out of that is some of the things we've tried to do, hopefully underpin what I would describe as a nascent performance by Birmingham on that uh, uh, peaky uh, graph. But it's not good enough. That point was also made very clearly by Paul. And so you do come, I think, to one thing above all else, the R&D money. Now, obviously, let's not fall into the trap that the only company, the only place for R&D money is the government. Uh, private companies have huge R&D money. And obviously, are we doing our best to make sure they contribute here? But the unique, but the thing I really wanted to call out was if you look at what's happening in the West Midlands, industry is investing very heavily in R&D. The government is not investing in R&D in the West Midlands. We are the outlier in that respect, four times as much industrial investment as government investment, and the government investment in R&D. It's not just, Paul, that we want that 14.5 billion or whatever you said. Currently, the government is spending a huge proportion of its R&D investment in the Golden tri Triangle. So it will accentuate the differences rather than equalise them. So there is a really important debate to be had with government about how that equalisation occurs. Now, there was a tiny step towards it, but incredibly welcome in the in the uh, trailblazer, in the sorry, the levelling up white paper with the innovation accelerators for us, Manchester and Glasgow, the three cities on your graph. Um, it's about 33 million each, but it is really, really small. But we've got to use that as a sort of sprat to catch a mackerel to demonstrate with a little bit of public money, we can actually build this capability. But the debates, Andrew, that we are currently having are now with the a new chair and CEO of uh, UKRI, Innovate UK, to make a move on mass scale around this. And uh, the obvious point to come out then to finish my contribution is given you've now done this sort of intellectual underpinning of our argument, we would love to work with you on how we can actually take that forward practically. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, that chimed perfectly in a sense. This for us is a staging post and our intention yeah. is lots more in uh, with places, but also 
and more generally in this kind of space over the next um, 12 months. So that's a perfect combination of that. So thank you for, the, for, for that. We'll come back to lots of it. Um, I, th I suppose different ways to think about it. We've had some questions in. I mean, already some concerns. I understand them around. If we focus on a few places, what does that mean for everywhere else? Are we excluding other places? I think Paul said we're not necessarily excluding other places, but we are making choices about where to invest um, for the reasons that we've we've outlined. And I think that's quite important in a sense. I think too many uh, schemes have spread activity everywhere or a bit of money everywhere. And I think the history tells us and the lessons tell us that if we want to see significant change, we need to pick a fewer number of places and really double down on those sorts of uh, places to see meaningful meaningful change. So um, we can debate that, but I think that's that's where we we currently are. We think that some of our big cities are, you know, are, have big opportunities in order to make some real progress over the next decade. So some choices in, inevitably need to be made. However, so put that to a side, that's some of the questions, but keep them coming in. Um, I, I wanted to start really, Lee, maybe start with you, because this came up in Fran's contribution and indeed um, in Andy's, just say a little bit about skills and talent. You know, you talked about you needing to, to get different types of skills and talent. Just say a little bit about what that means uh, for you in, in practical terms. And I'll bring Fran back in and, and Andy can say a little bit more about how, you know, there's a lot of work going on in the skills space, how we're trying to boost the talent pool in, in our places like, uh, like Birmingham uh, and elsewhere. So Lee, just, just say a little bit more about that for now. Yeah, so there's... There's obviously a huge amount of manufacturing talent and hardware talent in 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 the West. Um, it's not as specialist as there's not enough specialists in those areas. So what you tend to have is a lot of the larger companies will offer very big pay packets to keep those people there. So when you're a small company growing, it's very hard to incentivize people. They have to be really bought into the, the, the vision of the business. Um, we do try and um, source people from the UK first, and then if not, we do promote um, through visa programs. Um, but when it comes to software, that becomes even more challenging. So even though we are a hardware business primarily, actually we our backbone is software. So we have more software engineers than hardware engineers. And a big drain on that is London. So a, a big pull of all software engineers will migrate automatically to London, partially because everyone goes to London because that's the thing to do. But also uh, there's a there's quite a, a high salary boost, even though the cost to live in is higher. People tend not to do the math in their head. And so they'll they'll go, oh, well, my pay is twice as much in London. Um, and so there's a big um, the, the, there's a uphill battle when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, luckily, we are in an environment where there's a lot of automotive. Um, and we are seeing not only new automotive companies coming out. Um, there's a few of them around. Some are doing well, some are not so much. Um, but that's the nature of, of, of competition, right? Some companies will survive, some companies won't. That is a perfectly normal way of running a capitalist society. And so uh, a, a really important thing that we want to do is to e make sure that we're on a level playing field when it comes to the very large businesses. And so for us, things like um, UKRI, so we, we're on seven Innovate UK grants. We, we've done seven Innovate UK grants. And that's enabled us to upskill our people through training programs internally. But it's also enabled us to kind of show that we've got credibility, which actually is very important for engineers. They want to make sure that they're they're making a big difference um, in the world. And it's not just another similar business to what they've dealt with before. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I was going to come to Andy, but he's disappeared. So I'll hold on to him for a second and come back. Fran, do you want to say just... We're going to we'll take different issues in turn, um, but just say something about um, about that sort of talent and how you think about what's going on in the patch and how we you know how we might support the the growth of the talent pool more generally. Fran. Yeah, I think from a talent perspective, you know, um, COVID-19 in, in some respects highlighted the best of British innovation and business dynamism. Um, 
uh, and we just need to maintain that that positive um, sustainable impact. I think flexible working, I think remote working has helped in the battle for talent. Um, as there's not always been a drain into London. So we've seen that a lot in our in our clients as well. But I guess one of the other points I wanted to make, going back to Andy's point around inward investment, yeah. um, I, I think generally to, to, to help make sure uh, what's actually quite critical is to make sure that the UK scene is an easy place to do business with, um, uh, particularly on the in the talent piece as well. So clarity, certainty and predictability is really what we need. Um, and I think that will help support uh, in the longer term talent warfare as well as um, ensuring that we have the best place for innovation and growth. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think, you know, there's there's the grow your own type of, of approach, but there's also a being attractive to talent that is, you know, from elsewhere. And we make some re recommendations in the report about, you know, the way some of the international visa systems could be yes. evolved and developed to make them even more attractive than they they currently are recognizing we you know that we need to be a home for specialists but andy just say something about you know you you rightly focused you know since you've been in post and before when you were in the chair of the lep about the importance of skills growing your own but also then how you match that into what to what businesses need in the, in the area more thoughts on that what would make yeah it yeah um i think actually i'll try to make it really simple andrew make just one point um, and the reason I was just momentarily away, I want to just pick up one piece of data because I think you'll all be interested in this. This is data on the nature of vacancies in the region uh, on unique job postings, uh, literally just literally hot off the press um, uh, now. And our biggest area of vacancies for uh, software development professionals, exactly what Lee said. And the fast, that's grown 20% in one month. So while vacancies are falling, just beginning to fall across the economy, that's growing fast. And the other half of IT, IT business analysts, architects, systems designers, is fifth in our ranking of type of jobs. So ahead of all the really big categories like nursing, teaching, da da da. And that's also, and that's going fast. So there's a really simple lesson in this data that they, uh, which absolutely chimes with what Paul said. The growth in job opportunities is in this new economy stuff, because this is what underpins almost every one of those sectors. And we had another piece of data on this just recently, growth in the West Midlands tech economy, uh, nearly four billion pounds in one year. So the stuff is all shouting at us uh, that this is where the growth is. And so what we are trying to do to your question is to make sure that we are either providing digital boot camps for entry pieces, we're making sure our colleges are stepping into this with their digital innovation zones. Our universities, of course, are stepping into the more specialist areas here. So it's all about where is the demand coming from and how do we then try to match that up? Yeah. But I honestly think the, the area that tackles this has got a huge advantage given that those vacancy issues there. And as Lee said, his location decisions are very much around where can you find these people? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's mission critical to it, the whole thing, Andrew. Great, that's really good. Lee, come back. I mean, are you struggling with labor, you know, with skill shortages currently? Lee? Are you, are, you know, are you yeah. somewhat constrained because you can't find talent X or you know, or you know, specialism Y? Is is that a real a real burden? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the 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 things about a small business that's growing fast is you need to bring skills in straight away. Um, you can upskill and you can kind of internally train takes years right it's it's nothing that you can do so unfortunately you're in a position where everyone you need is has been in the job for 10 years or, or five like a senior position and then our, our strategy internally is to go well we'll recruit really amazing people in like a-listers like really good people salary is not really a concern but then when you compete with the bigger companies it becomes a concern um, and then you start built having apprentices on board and so for me, um, a perfect strategy from the government would be to simplify the visa system and be consistent with the visa system as well, because you speak to anyone abroad and they're asking you what, what's going on and you're like, I, I, I have no idea. Um, and, and even, yeah, like, honest, I, I've, heard, I've heard multiple different visa routes for different people uh, recently. Um, and then you incentivize it. Maybe there's a tax incentive to begin with to get those people on, get them up to speed. And then you've then got the personnel in the business to do the, the, the kind of homegrown in, internal training and recruitment on top. Because the problem is you can't just place 
apprentices into work when you don't have somebody sitting there. Um, and usually you need a couple of those people there anyway because they're too busy doing their jobs, right? So there's always this thing where you, you need to solve the immediate challenges. Um, you have to run quick in a small business and when you're growing, but then you probably can dedicate 30% of that time to go, okay, let's future-proof the business and train people up. Um, but, it, but investors are not concerned about that. Right? Investors do not care about training people up over four or five years. They want to see results really quick. So you're dealing about private money. You have to weigh both of those up. You have to have a good balance of, all right, I'm getting the best in the world in, but I'm also making sure that if they disappear or as we build that skill set up, that you've got that that strong foundation that, that is very difficult to kind of budge. Yeah, and in a sense, you need to be, you know, we need to be consistently and constantly working on both of those, uh, both of those sort of parallel lines in some respects, or they're not parallel, but you know yeah, what I mean. And, trying to do yeah, it. And, yeah, and we have to we have to be honest with ourselves as well. As Andy just mentioned, right, the jobs are skyrocketing in terms of what people need, and you cannot solve all of that internally. Like you just can't, not in a short period of time. What you can do is bring in amazing talent from um, uh, other countries. You can use them to upskill everyone. And, th and then everyone's in a good place. Yeah. Um, and you're actually then building people into a, a new economy mindset as well. Yeah. Um, because what you find out is that a lot of people are traditionally from some of the big automotive manufacturers. They have a different approach of um, how to, to deal with projects and jobs. And that's very different to basically what you would equate to Silicon Valley kind of mindset yep. in these new economies that are growing very quickly. Great. Excellent. Good. We're going to move on to funding and finance in a second. Last question to you, Andy. Just, just You're obviously in conversations with the government around the trailblazer. I know that you've said before that skills is an important component of the conversations that you're having. You just, just rehearse for us what, you know, what would... What would you like in that out of that conversation in terms of the skills space? Yeah, uh, so there's three things actually we've asked for, and I'm optimistic on all of them. And you'd be interested actually if you had Andy Burnham on, I think he'd say something very similar actually. Uh, the first is that, of course, we already have some direct power through the adult education budget. That's where, for example, the digital boot camps are funded from. Uh, we are looking for the responsibility for overall coordination of 16 to 18 technical uh, provision. Uh, so you know the government's policy is this local skills improvement panel led by employers. That's good because it tells you what is required and our chambers of comms that. But at the moment, it is completely unclear who has the responsibility for responding to that, designing the whole piece. We are arguing we should be doing that and then commission the different responses. The second element is we have uh, asked for uh, uh, control actually of the careers service in the West Midlands. It is incredibly patchy. There are some brilliant examples of local work by uh, Careers and Enterprise Council, but it is very, very inconsistent. And again, it is pretty unlinked to the employer demand piece. So we are basically saying to government, we will be a pilot there in terms of setting a standard in that respect. And the third thing is a little away from this conversation actually, but um, I mean, the interesting point that Lee drew out, yes, Jobs are skyrocketing in that area. I've still got incredibly serious unemployment in some areas where people are very, very far from the labour market and are not going to contribute to this. And actually, we are. Uh, the truth is, the national policies like Restar are pretty ineffective in really tough left behind places because people are so far. The issues tend to be around um, uh, offending. Uh, they tend to be around mental health. They tend to be around housing benefit entitlements. And they are really serious in the top issues. And we are asking with DWP for a responsibility to design the pre-employment packages around that as well. So it's not as near to this, but it is a, a, a real address on the inactivity uh, uh, figures that feature Great. in the economy. That's a fantastic point to, uh, to, uh, to remind us on that the skills challenges span the, the breadth of uh, of the of the issues. Um, let's go on to um, funding and finance. Can we raise the issue in the paper? Fran, you've touched it al already. Obviously, you know, funding and finance is important. Uh, how do we how do we think about new economy businesses, the type of funding, the type of finance that they need? Do we need to encourage more of them to take external funding? Is that the problem? Whereas, you know, what what's the challenge for us in the funding and finance space? 
Yeah, and, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, Andrew, we, we've launched recently a 250 million growth lending pot for tech new economy businesses, which have proven technology, but might, might not at the moment be profitable in order to support them. Um, also, we partnered um, as well with Wired this year, uh, looking at 75 businesses, strangely, we called them trailblazers of wealth as well, which uh, Lee's company Petalite is, is one of them, looking at highly innovative businesses to shine a light on those businesses as well. I mean, there's always a dynamic here about when equity investment comes in and where bank funding is. And what we're trying to do is bridge the gap with some of these um, uh, growth lending schemes that we have, uh, particularly um, where we're looking at going into sustainable finance as well. So we're really keen to support these new technology businesses. And Andy mentioned it earlier, we want all major cities to perform in the UK, um, as well as in the Midlands as well. And, and we looked at five regions across the whole country. So 75 brilliant tech businesses that we're looking to support going forward as well. So there's, there's a real focus on this as driving um, growth in our business as a key, a key part of driving the economy going forward. I'm so various a, themes. Yeah, and taking a sort of place-based approach to thinking about funding and what 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 advantages does that give you as a you know you're a global institution a national institution but you're obviously you, you finish by talking a little bit about you know taking a more of a place based approach how does that advantage you how does that benefit you and then obviously your the businesses that you're working with well, we want all parts of the the country to grow. Um, we are centred in um, uh, Birmingham, but we have our uh, M and S biz, business in Chester. We have our first direct business in in Leeds. Um, our global head office is in in the UK. So we wanted to look at the five main regions within the country, uh, including Scotland as well, to highlight the different types of innovation that are coming out of the big of the big cities. Is if we grow together, we will succeed together um, as well. And I think that's part of what the report also highlights uh, today. Great. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Lee, come in on this, you know, the sort of funding and finance question, obviously, to the extent that it directly relates to you, but then think more broadly about, you know, funding and finance coming into these sorts of industries. You know, there's always often debt is easier, but not necessarily as relevant as equity. And, you know, there's a long standing conversation about, you know, giving more favorable conditions to equity relative to debt. But just what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Uh, so we we would cl be classed by investors probably one of the most high risk type of businesses to invest in. We're a, a hardware business. We've got a long time horizons. Um, people like software, right? Easy, simple. You can test it very quickly. Um, so we actually um, probably fifty percent, around fifty percent of our money in total that we spent in eight years has been through uh, UKRI. Um, that's a lot of work. It slows down the actual process to do it. You can't rely on it as like a critical path for operating your business, but it's there. It's it's great that it's it's been there and we applied for it and, and we we did all the competitions. Um, but at the same time, private money you have to they you have to deal with it to a certain point. Um, in this environment right now, um, I don't believe many people are doing debt uh, just because of the, the 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 way the world is after after the the. The issues with some big tech companies falling down. So if you look at the series B's and C's, um, the amount of money that's gone into them recently is, is nosedived. Um, my personal experience from private investment is I avoid regional altogether. Um, I've tried to raise regionally, never works or you get a really bad deal. Um, I think there's two reasons why partly because of the mindset of, of, of the the clusters of investors that you talk to in those areas. It's, it's very, fairly concreted in. Um, but also just the, the sheer access to capital. Um, you've, got to, you've got to be talking to hundreds and hundreds of investors to get down to the one that you want. Um, and so for, for me personally, I did all the, the kind of routes in, in the Midlands, um, and then I just got on a train to London three day, three times a week. So I had the advantage of operating my business in the West Midlands, um, but then I was pitching in, in London. Um, now, uh, our recent close of our investment, I, Fran and Andy know this, um, we just got a, a quite big American investors on board. Um, that wasn't me sitting in the West Midlands, right? This This is... I think that's the dirty work that you have to do. You have to be traveling all the time to, to get these done. And it's just the nature of business. Um, and if you're passionate about your business, 
you, you will go to those extents to try and get those those deals across. So I do think yeah. it is a bit separate to the, the regional factor um, when it comes to finance. Interesting. Andy, come in on, on this because, you know, there is a strand of I, I'm genuinely unclear as to how I think about this. And you can see this in the report, by the way, if you if you read it, we're a bit unclear about it. But, you know, there's a lot there is a strand, which is we have to have regionally orientated funding on the supply side in order to to match and respond to the demands that we see it. But I'm, I'm interested in your thought. And I'm just not I'm just not clear in my head as to whether I. I'm a fan of that or not. Yeah, it's a very that's a very honest point, Andrew. And if I'm honest, I'm a little uncertain of this as well, because um, Lee's story and many congratulations to him about traveling the world and getting his investment is obviously brilliant. But um, I hear regularly that one of the things that holds back high growth potential businesses here is a lack of access to the type of funding that would be there let's not say in London, but in the most sophisticated markets uh, in the US. Now, the question is, do you have to have those companies based in the West Midlands for them to be able to do what is needed? I'm not sure you do, but you sure have to be able to, I, don't, I just don't think that's realistic, but you sure do have to have a, a way in which our best companies get access to them. And so that's subtly different. Um, and that's certainly something we've got to think about. So other answers to it, of course, a lot of companies are spin outs of the universities. Uh, the North has got ahead of us in their university spin out on Northern Gridstone. We will do the same. That's important. We obviously are looking at further angel networks. We have some, but not enough. And they tend to have local focus. So that's part of an answer. But the thing I also want to come back to is the UKRI and Innovate UK approach to this, uh, which comes back right to your report. Because Lee said he's had half of his money from Innovate UK, which, again, is very, very telling. There aren't many companies where that would be the case. And I think one of the reasons for it is it's very staccato. It's very individual applications. And where I want to get, and I've literally sat down with the chair of UKRI to talk about this, is to think about the areas the West Midlands has got real potential and how do we develop a fund with them which is more consistent, more long term, and businesses can bid into at the moment, it's very much responding to their um, their themes. And I want it to be more regionally focused at time Lee's nodding at me. So I think there is a really important conversation about now they've got that additional funding, which interesting, Jeremy Hunt stood by, didn't he, in the budget when he was under such pressure, how that actually turns into funds that can be more regionally focused. And, and with, obviously, without divulging any confidences, Andy, are you, are you confident that... You know, that move towards a, a greater appreciation of place and what it means in practice for these sorts of institutions, which typically have not really done that. It, you know, you, you feel confident that we are. I feel, making... I feel confident the conversation started, Andrew. I do not feel confident we're yet at the outcome we want. Um, but that's why your report is very timely. I feel confident that senior ministers like Michael Gove really get this and understand it. Um, there's another element, though, that should be brought into this, uh, DIT as well. Because uh, a lot of investment, uh, we've talked a lot about growing local companies in the case of Lee, but obviously one of the answers to this is where are footloose global companies going to locate? And there is lots of evidence uh, that DIT uh, favours the southeast naturally because that's where the clusters are naturally already there, and you will never achieve what we want if you keep backing that. And some of it we've got, I won't be indiscreet, but we've got some current examples in the health sector that just make anyone believe in levelling up weep. Uh, and so there is a really a debate with um, uh, with DIT about how they play their role in this as well. Yeah, and I th if I remember rightly, the part of your trailblazer conversation is about getting some control over an influence That's more right. inward investment program that UK runs, but also what you could potentially run so relative you. to you know maybe to Wales or to Scotland traditionally. Correct. Yeah, brilliant, excellent. Fran, come back in. I'm genuine. I'm you know. Both Andy and I sort of shared our uncertainties on, you know, how you think how we should think about the the finance element of it, which I greatly appreciate. But you just come back in on that. Where where do you kind of sit on that? What what's your thought on that? Well, I guess um, it depends on the client. It depends on what their strategic aim is. It depends. There's a lot of depending factors, um, and we work with lots of companies to help them get the right sort of finance that that is right for their business at the right time. So I don't think there's sort of one answer uh, fits fits all. It might be limited debt capacity to start with because 
from a owner's point of view, giving up equity early on in a journey is not always the right thing to do, um, but it's ensuring that we get the right type of investor in front of the right uh, business at the right time for them would be that. I, 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 it's not just sort of one size fits all. Um, we're increasingly seeing uh, UK uh, export finance as opportunity for businesses to raise finance. Um, they can raise finance based on future sales forecasts if they want to. So I think there is a wide variety, but um, I think it's all about partnership. Uh, I go back to my earlier point. It's about how we can facilitate uh, that partnership in private public sector, uh, institutional funds, equity investors, uh, and just ensuring the proposition is very bankable up front. And do you think, I mean, uh, Andy referenced this earlier on, you know, I'm not saying you would have, but if you have read the, the levelling up white paper in all its glory, you know, there are several strands in there, actually one big strand around funding and finance, you know, unlocking different types of uh, funding and finance, public and private, to, to, to yeah. or public policy aims, I suppose, in some respects, or uh, in the way to, to think about it, are you are you confident about that? Are you you know are you enthused by that? Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, we need to to um, uh, leverage up uh, the balance sheet, whether that be public or private, um, to drive innovation investment. Uh, whether that be big big projects or small innovative businesses going forward. I think there's an opportunity at this point in time uh, to grow our business and ensure, and ensure that we get that growth. But it goes back to my earlier point. I think clarity, certainty, predictability to invest in the UK is paramount. And I think that's where government can help us. Yeah, okay. That's really helpful. Right, we've had quite a few, we've had lots of questions come in. Paul's doing a sterling job of answering all the questions that relate to the report. So in the background, so well done to you, Paul, on that. Keep those fingers moving. Um, but we've had several questions around, I suppose, the broader offer of a place. Maybe, Andy, maybe you start, because in a sense, you know, these things, none of these things operate in a vacuum. No firm operates in a vacuum. This is about the nature of the offer that a place can make to, to not just individuals, but, uh, you know, many individuals, families, communities. Etc., which is you know a housing offer, a transport offer, a quality of life offer, an amenity offer. I mean, just your thoughts on that, Annie. How important is that as part of you know the package that somewhere like the West Midlands can offer that maybe other places can't because of the nature of the place itself? It's um, mission critical. Uh, so you know, in politics uh, and the way government's structured, everyone looks down one vertical and says we're going to have a conversation about housing, and then the next day you have a conversation about culture. <laughs> And that's not how people make decisions in life, is it? Uh, so our uh, approach here is that, um, uh, I'm gonna describe it in rather an economist's way now, rather Very than, than politician's way, is that everything we've been talking about so far is a pretty much a pure eco economics conversation, isn't it? About which businesses are gonna thrive, uh, how do you uh, support them uh, with talent, with finance? But you actually do have to say, um, what's the total offer to attract those people who are going to come and make these things fly. And that's where, when we have our own investment conversations with footloose investors from around the world, you very quickly get to what's the quality of the housing. So for us, uh, the housing target, and we're actually doing, you know, it was covered in national press this week, doing a really good job on that. So it's the total number of houses, the variety of tenancies, uh, the quality of the design, that's just as much a critical component of these footloose decisions. And you do then come to, all the descriptions of is it has it got green space? What's the cultural activities? What's the leisure activities? And we think that the, it's, uh, we think that the big urban centres have got an incredibly important role to play on behalf of the country in being those attractors because they almost by default are the only places you can pull that total offer together. So the whole place approach to this is absolutely the heart of what our pitch is, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, it's it, we make this point in the report, and we've made this point hundreds of times, as of you, hundreds of times. Just trying, you know, thinking about the package, very deliberately yeah, thinking about right. the package of activity rather than trying not to be too, to be too yeah. silo, and actually trying to do it at the place level. You know, at your level is probably easier than actually trying to do this through national coordination. Exactly. And I mean, and this might sound an odd link to make, Andrew, but I'll just draw the story. And I think the Brummies on the line will know this is true. Uh, we've not necessarily had the best uh, international reputation, although our international reputation is better than our domestic reputation, interestingly, <laughs> research says historically, which says it all. 
Uh, but one of the reasons we were determined to win and then put on a brilliant Commonwealth Games was that was our branding moment in the sun. And I hope everyone thinks that we took that opportunity really well. My perception from uh, international exposure since then is it has changed the perception of Birmingham and the West Midlands decisively. And, and but then we've got to, we've got to catch in on that. So that's what I mean about the whole brand is critical. Yeah. Lee, come in on this. I mean, in a sense, obviously, on, on what, in one respect, you're looking inward into the firm and what the firm needs and what it can offer. You talked about wages and terms and conditions, but you sit, obviously, in a broader context, you sit in Birmingham. You know, I guess what Birmingham has to offer, or what a place has to offer is quite significantly important, you know, for you and for the for, for the business base more generally. Yeah, I mean, um, we've got global expansions uh, ambitions, right? So we're we're looking to to both be in the US and Europe in the next two years, and so we're always assessing, especially bringing new people in. The, the question is always like, why why are you here? Um, and I I can argue my corner as much as I I want because I am the founding CEO, but at the same time, there has to be these regional kind of ambitions um there's a lot of we we do lean on a lot of the legacy of, of automotive manufacturing even though we we, we are going to be making large charges um it's a similar environment right so we do have a legacy piece but also i think it's quite important and i think your report highlighted it um around the facts that even if you have good strengths in general manufacturing it doesn't really translate into specialist manufacturing um we've noticed this uh, all along the supply chain so vast majority of our, our stuff is not made in the UK. Our parts are not made in the UK. And that's just because of the nature of electronics. And um, this is where you see in America, they got the CHIPS Act because they realized that that is a, a, a difficult thing. Um, there needs to be put more emphasis on, on that industry as a whole, rather than pick a company and go all in on one company with a 100 mil or 200 mil. It's like you need a, a significant budget to look at that entire supply chain. Um, I know that um, the UKRI do that sometimes. They do some of the supply chain things, but the budgets there are, are nowhere near what's needed to really change an economy because that's what we're aiming to do, right? We're aiming to take somebody who used to make stampings for internal combustion engines and make them do something that's completely brand new. And and when you're talking trillions of dollars, because that's you got to think there's trillions of dollars on on play here. Um, if we actually want to be a significant force in, in this area of electrification, and I'm obviously focused on electrification, that, that's important. Yeah. Um, you have to commit and, and you will have losses and you will have wins. But if you if you spread the bets as a, as a country, you need to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, you just need to do, let's pick another battle. Um, and, and hopefully we're going to see that with this this report coming out and pressure from towards the government. And that we start seeing serious commitments down that chain. Brilliant, excellent. Brian, come in on this. You know, in the sense yeah, that well, you know, you're, you know, you're focusing as a you know a bank, a finance house, but actually, mm -hmm. you know, the broader offer of a of a place uh, is obviously important more generally. And well, I just wanted to pick up one point Lee, Lee made about supply chain. You know, in post in a post COVID environment, we have seen supply chains coming to near shoring. So actually, there are opportunities in the UK as businesses look to bring their supply chain closer to where they are. So I think, you know, going back to that inward investment, if we could have one sort of UK view, I think that would be really important to, to, grow, our, to grow our business. Um, in terms of the brand West Midlands, Andy knows I relocated here as part of many other colleagues that moved uh, to the West Midlands and, and, and Basin Burning. It's my 11th uh, different region working for the bank and it's probably the one I'm going to retire in but not quite yet Andy but uh, <laughs> cer certainly from a positivity point of view that the brand of the West Midlands and Birmingham was remarkably heightened through um, a very successful Commonwealth game so thank you for that my family enjoyed it very much. Very good <laughs> that is a fantastic uh, kind of way to to finish I know people have other commitments and I so I really appreciate people making time available today to talk about the report and thank you for your very uh, kind words about it if there are things that we missed which we almost certainly have and things that we should explore in more detail uh, I very much welcome uh, some comments uh, on that as well uh, but it's 10 45 and I said we would finish around now so thank you very much to my panel Fran 
to Andy and to, to Lee. Thanks to HSBC for supporting us on this project and working with us uh, in a fantastic way. Thanks for everybody for posting questions and for coming along. You can read the report, you can listen to the podcast, you can watch the video and everything else on our website, centerforcities.org. But until the next time, take care and stay safe. And if I don't see you, have a very good Christmas. Thank you all indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.